Fear comes in a variety of forms, and few things are less comfortable than living in a state of fear. The anxiety, the tension, it seems more than we can bear. Fear isolates us, chases us down, boxes us in. Fear leaves us feeling like there's no escape, reaching out for us with unseen hands. Ominous clouds gather, and darkness settles over our soul. But where does fear come from? And why does it hold power over us? How do we learn, despite the gathered darkness, that there is nothing to fear? How do we face the night and await the coming dawn? In life's most terrifying moments, we hear the voice of the Savior say, Fear not. And fear is sort of a funny thing. Not funny ha-ha, or else it wouldn't really be fear, right? But, but it's an odd sort of, of thing, because when we think of fear, we tend to think of, uh, of something that, that means we're running from whatever it is we're afraid of. We're, we're trying to get away from something. Uh, we, we tend to think of it in terms of weakness, right? That's why Little kids tease their buddies when they're scared of the dark. Like, scary cat, scary cat. You know, it's, it's why bullies taunt their victims who are afraid of getting beat up. Like, what are you, a chicken? <laughs> you know, like, we're used to thinking about fear as a sign of weakness. And yet, the same thing that makes you afraid... That same neurological impulse is also the thing that can give you the courage to face your fears. Right? And so it's this weird paradox where fear, is it, is it weakness? Is it strength? Is it just being smart? Uh, you know, and we're not sure what to do with the things we're afraid of. And so we leave question with questions like, is... Is fear a good thing? Is fear a bad thing? Is it morally neutral? And if so, what determines whether fear is used for good or evil purposes? Right? There's more questions than answers, it seems. With the paradox of fear. But perhaps that's a good place for us to start, because if we look into the pages of Scripture, it has its own sort of paradox of fear that we have to make sense of. Because as we look into biblical, uh, the, the biblical uh, story, we, we run into a couple of commands that really seem at odds with one another. On the one hand, we hear things like, fear God. But then over and over again, we hear a command to say, fear not. And we're not exactly sure what to do with that, right? So we're, we're kind of like, okay, so I should fear God, but I shouldn't be afraid of anything. Okay. Got it. Sort of. And we just kind of live with that tension of what are we supposed to do? Because the command to fear not makes us assume fear has to be a bad thing. And then we're told to fear God, and we go, oh, maybe not. Proverbs tells us that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and yet over and over again throughout Scripture, well over a hundred times we hear this some version of this command, fear not, do not be afraid. And so we're left holding these things in tension. And over the next few weeks, we want to lean into that tension. We want, we want to lean into this, this paradox of fear and see how we strive to apply the ways and words of Jesus. And if that can't help us to navigate this tension in a way that helps us to both fear God and not be afraid of anything. Because it seems like, on the surface at least, 
That's the goal that Scripture holds out for us. And if we're going to investigate why fear matters, we have to figure out where fear comes from. And so that's where we want to start today. We want to, we want to dial in and see if we can't figure out where fear is rooted in, where fear comes from. And to do that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning, to a time before fear. Now, if you're familiar with the opening chapters of the biblical story, some of this will sound very familiar to you. You might remember how God creates this world and he calls it good. And then you might remember how as creation moves along and moves towards its climax, God creates humanity. And he says it is very good. And the opening chapters of the biblical story leave us with this picture of humanity living in harmony with the rest of creation and with their creator. And God said, that it was very good. Humanity finds itself in harmony with creation and with the Creator, living under the sovereign authority of God as their king. And And they're granted rule on his behalf over all of creation. They pretty much have free reign of the place with one important distinction, one exception. In the midst of the garden that God plants, there are two trees. The first is the tree of life from which they are permitted to eat as a source to sustain their life. It is this tree that seems to promise them life everlasting in the garden. But the second tree is a tree called the knowledge a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that tree comes with a prohibition. God says, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So, essentially, all of creation is stretched out before them. They have free reign to do as they will, with one exception. They don't get to determine for themselves what is right and wrong. That's essentially what this tree is about. It's about knowing the difference between good and evil. God says, the one thing that is off limits for you as creature in the kingdom of the Creator is to usurp His authority and set the rules for yourself. Because only the king gets to set the rules and there is only one king. (laughs) We're not told how long this idyllic state in Eden lasts. We're merely told that the first seeming thing of any significance to take place is the story of how it's undone. (laughs) If you know the story, if you're familiar with the beginning of the biblical story, you know what happens next. Genesis chapter 3 introduces us to a new character, the serpent who's more crafty than all the beasts of the field. And the serpent comes to the woman, and he tempts her with the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying, if you eat of it, you will be like God. You will will understand the difference between good and evil. Now, it's important for us to note at that point, there's not a lie there. It's just a distortion of the full weight of the truth. Right? The, the serpent doesn't say anything that isn't true. There's just a whole bunch more implication that goes with eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he kind of skips over. Like, he says, surely God wouldn't keep this from you. This is good. And so it's there. In that moment that we begin to discover the source of fear. Let's step into the text this morning, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to kind of take a a long bird's eye view of, uh, of a 
a chunk of Scripture today, but we want to begin here in Genesis chapter 3, and I'm already feeling like I don't have enough hands, so we'll see how this goes. But <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 6 as you open your Bibles, click on a device, follow along in new version, however you want to get there. We read this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid. Because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Catch it. I heard you in the garden and I hid because I was afraid. Now, it seems to be an implication within this text that this is not the first time God has come walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The text doesn't explicitly tell us that, but there, there seems to be this implication that this is a normal occurrence. What the text does tell us is this is the first time, however, that humanity felt the need to hide themselves from God. And God asks the question, where are you? Not because he's seeking information, as if he somehow couldn't find them in their makeshift hiding place. Rather, uh, he, he is asking the question you might ask to say, what's going on here? Where, where are you? What's happened? You're, you're not where I would expect you to be. You're not here in the place you normally are. What is going on? And the answer comes back. I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid. Now, in the, uh, the earlier part of the story, the end of Genesis chapter 2, we get this definitive line at the end of the chapter that says, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So somehow, somewhere in the space of these 10 verses between the end of Genesis 2 and Genesis 3.10, something dramatic has taken place that has suddenly changed everything about humanity's experience in the garden. And the thing that has changed that sin and human rebellion have corrupted God's good world. Suddenly, the, this idyllic paradise that was as God intended is suddenly no longer as it should be. And so the man and his wife are naked and ashamed, and they hide in fear. And so we begin to get a sense of, okay, so where does fear come from? What is the source of fear? We begin to understand that, that the fear has its source in sin. But, but we want to be careful because we need to understand that doesn't necessarily mean that being afraid is sinful, right? Because we have all those commands, fear God, right? So clearly, we're not being commanded to do something that is inherently sinful, inherently a violation of who God is. So it's not that, that, that being afraid is sinful, but this idea of fear has its source in sin. It's rooted in the fallenness 
and the brokenness of relationship that sin brings with our Creator. The, the, the reason they're afraid is because there is now something different in the relationship they have with the God who gave them breath, who gave them life. Over the course of the series, we're going to dial in each week to just kind of one big idea, one thing you can kind of tuck away, you can take out of here. It will help you as you try to apply what we're talking about, what we're learning together, as you strive to live out the ways and words of Jesus. And for this, this first part of the series, that big idea comes in two parts. So we're going to hit for part of it now, and then in a few minutes when we put it all together, I think you'll begin to see where this tension of fear, this paradox of fear is rooted, and how we say, fear God, but don't be afraid of anything. First part of this big idea that we want to look at today is rooted right here in Genesis 3. It's the idea that sin will cause you to fear being in God's presence. Sin will cause you to fear being in God's presence. Again, this isn't the first time God has stepped into the garden to walk in the cool of the day, but it's the first time humanity felt the need to run and hide. And the only thing that has changed is the entry of sin into God's good world. God says, what, why, why are you afraid? Who, who told you that you were naked? Did, did, you, did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? See, sin will cause you to fear being in God's presence. Because there is a, a break in relationship. But again, if you're familiar with the biblical story, you know that it doesn't take long for God to initiate a plan that is drenched in His grace. After some conversation between God and the man and the woman and the serpent, God begins a redemptive plan. He, he clothes humanity. A few generations later, He'll single out a man named Abraham. And he'll invite him into a, a covenant relationship with himself. Okay, we're, we're going to hit fast forward here. This is the part where we have to go through a lot of biblical story, okay? God calls Abraham to himself, invites him into this relationship with himself. What was lost in the garden? What was broken in the garden? Relationship, fellowship with God. And so with Abraham, God once again invites humanity to come near him. When Abraham's descendants find themselves in bondage in Egypt, God once again continues his redemptive plan. He calls them out of slavery under the leadership of Moses. It's a, a, a specific event we're going to dig into a little bit more next week. Uh, it's one of those incredible stories that we know, so we just kind of gloss over it. But when we really take the time to let it just settle, it shows us so much about the depth of who God is and what it means for us to be His people. But that's for next week. But after God brings His people out of slavery, He brings them to Mount Sinai in the wilderness. And once more, God draws near to invite them into relationship. He, he delivers to them the, the Torah, the commandments, the words of God by which they can live. He's giving them a framework for a relationship. Saying, okay, like in the garden, there was really just one thing you couldn't do. And you really couldn't handle that. So clearly, we're going to have to we're gonna have to flesh this out a little bit, give you a better understanding of what it means to understand the holiness of God. So God delivers to them the Torah, beginning with what we would refer to as the Ten Commandments. And I think we tend to think of this moment, this covenant at Sinai, and we kind of picture Moses on the mountain just kind of scratching out the tablets, you know, like listening to God and kind of taking notes. It's a, it's a very kind of tranquil moment, like, oh, this is a big turning point in the history of God and His people. But the scene that, that the Old Testament describes for us 
is a little more dramatic than all of that. And I think if we take a few minutes to look at that, it will help us move towards the second half of this big idea that will help us make sense of this paradox of fear. Uh, so let's jump forward into the story into Exodus chapter 19. They've already come out of out of the wilderness or out of Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness. They've come to Sinai and God has told Moses that he is going to reveal himself. He's going to to give uh, his people his covenant law. And listen to how this is described in Exodus chapter 19 starting in verse 16. So on the morning of the third day There was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. And everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. And the smoke billowed up like Uh, smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. All right, so this is not Moses sitting on a rock carving out some notes. There's a thick, dark cloud swirling with thunder and lightning and fire and smoke. The, The mountain itself is shaking This is terrifying stuff. If you're somewhere and these things begin to manifest, you're going to say, this is not a place I should be. I need to leave. Right? Okay. This is a terrifying scene. We begin to make sense of some things. Because God has arrived on the scene in a dark cloud of thunder and lightning, which probably will take a lot more significance as the Old Testament unfolds. And we hear these stories of why Israel continually kept coming back to worship Baal. He's the storm god, the god who rides the thunder clouds. And you can begin to say, oh, so maybe God has a problem with Baal because he's trying to to be a pretender to who God really is. And there's this terrifying moment where there's earthquakes and thunder and lightning and darkness billowing up like smoke. And all of a sudden, those commands that say fear God start to come into focus really quick and you go, can do. Got it. Because this scene is terrifying. And God proceeds to speak to Moses and and he gives him what we call the Ten Commandments. And then look at the immediate response, immediately following the delivery of those, those commandments in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. I'm always amazed. Like, we have these, like, cinematic pictures of Moses coming down the mountain with the tablets, you know, and it's like, oh, the heavens open. It's like this glorious thing. Not so much for the folks at the bottom of the mountain. Moses comes down the mountain, and they're like, um, Moses, you go talk to God. We're going to stay here at a safe distance from the mountain, and you just let us know what he says, right? Sounds good. Like, you go into the thick, dark cloud where there's smoke and fire and thunder and lightning, and you just let us know what we need to do, and then we'll be good. And we contrast that with this image we have in Genesis 3, where God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And I think we probably tend to picture that far more tranquil than what we read about in Exodus 19 and 20. But should we? The Old Testament is really consistent on its description of the times when God's presence physically manifests. There is dark clouds of smoke and thunder and lightning and fire, and the earth trembles. Whether it's the pillar of fire that leads Israel through the wilderness, which we kind of just picture like it's just a flame. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not so sure about that after reading these descriptions. Whether it's Ezekiel's vision of the great wheeled throne of God that pulls up and Ezekiel knows this is not going to be a normal day. Whether it's Elijah calling down fire from heaven to determine that it is Yahweh, not Baal, who sends the lightning. The Old Testament seems really consistent in the way it describes God showing up. And so I wonder if perhaps we don't need to retroactively read that into the Genesis account when God steps into the garden in the cool of the day perhaps in a thick, dark cloud of fire and smoke and thunder and lightning. And all of a sudden, humanity's response, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid, takes on a whole different level of making sense to us. Adam had been in God's presence. But he had never been in God's presence with the barrier of broken relationship because of sin. And suddenly, the presence of the Holy One was terrifying. In Exodus chapter 19, it's remarkable. God tells Moses, he says, I want you to set up a barrier around the mountain because I don't want anybody breaking through. We don't want anybody who is unclean and unholy coming in contact with the holiness of the mountain because it's the place of my presence in this moment. And when we get to Exodus 20, it becomes clear, yeah, Moses, you don't need to build the barrier. Nobody's coming close to that mountain because they have experienced the presence of God and they want nothing to do with it in their brokenness. And the people tremble and they say, Moses, you go, you go. We want nothing to do with, with this, this God. It's terrifying. It's terrible. But look at what Moses tells them in verse 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. That's one thing to say, do not be afraid, if what you're picturing is God just kind of gently strolling through the, the garden, like, do, 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 do. Hey, what's going on, guys? Oh, what's wrong? It's a whole other thing when the mountain is trembling. When there is thick, dark clouds and billowing smoke and thunder and lightning for Moses to go, no, no. Do not be afraid. And so what he says, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And we begin to get some of this paradox put into better perspective for us and we can finish out the other part of this big idea. You see, sin will, will cause you to fear being in God's presence. Or God's presence will cause you to fear sin. Sin will cause you to fear being in God's presence. Or God's presence might just cause you to fear sin. In Eden, there is this breach in relationship, and the result is terror. I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, so I hid. And in our sinfulness, 
we come into contact with God's holiness, the natural result is fear. But at Sinai, God begins to to take steps to re reframe a relationship with how in our sinfulness and our brokenness we can come near His holiness. We begin to see God trying, trying to renew His intentions, to dwell with His people, intending that maybe when we encounter His holiness, it will decrease our desire for sin that breaks a relationship with him. But if you know the rest of the Old Testament story, if you're familiar with the the story of Israel at all, you know that doesn't go very well. Even with the framework of the covenant, even with, with the Torah, with the Ten Commandments and all the other commands and laws that God decrees to them, continually God's people fall away. They chase idols. They depart from His ways. Over and over again throughout the story of humanity, throughout the story that we find in the pages of Scripture, just like in Eden, the people chose their sin rather than their king. But God's continual plan for redemption and renewal would not be thwarted. And so as the story continues to unfold, one more time, Scripture tells us that God comes near. And this time, He didn't come near in a storm cloud with fire and billows of smoke and thunder and lightning. He drew near, robed in flesh, in the person of Jesus. And near the end of His earthly ministry, In John's account of Jesus' life, John tells us of a moment when some Gentiles came seeking an audience with Jesus. Let's look at this together in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 20. It says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast, and they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. So Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it, said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. As the Gentiles come seeking an audience with Jesus, he recognizes that this is the moment when he will be glorified. He recognizes this is the moment where his earthly ministry, the mission that his father had sent him on, is coming to its climax and its conclusion. so he prays, Lord, glorify your name. And when God speaks, those who heard it said it thundered. 
when drop God comes near. It tends to come like a thick, dark cloud of fire and smoke, thunder and lightning. And Jesus says, if you will come after me, you will be where I am. Eden's intent, restored, renewed, redeemed. And yet there's still something about being in the presence of God that has the terrible ring of thunder. Jesus says when he is lifted up, he will draw everyone to himself. God's presence making us holy so that we can once more live in right relationship with a holy God. Sin will cause you to fear God's presence. The, the relationship is broken. And, and so, so God's very presence becomes terrifying. But if we will draw near to the presence of God, it begins to reverse that. And suddenly, God's presence begins to make us fear sin. And it's the cross of Jesus that makes all the difference. It, it, in, in Eden, sin made humanity hide. And, and at, at Sinai, God's presence kept sinful humanity at a distance. But at Calvary, God's love invites us to draw near. I invite the band to come back. The story of Scripture paints for us this incredible paradox of fear. We are simultaneously told over and over again to fear God and to fear not. And it's only when we begin to understand that the source of fear is rooted in sin, and more specifically, rooted in the broken relationship that sin brings can we begin to understand the tension in which we're called to live? That barrier of broken relationship is removed at the cross and we're invited to draw near so that instead of sin making us afraid of God, His presence begins to encourage us that we will not let something so trivial as our desires and our sin to stand in between a right relationship with Him. It, it, it invites us to look at the things that would cause a broken relationship with a holy God and say, what will you trade that for? Will you, once more, as humanity has done over and over again, choose your sin rather than a relationship with your king? And whether it's Coming to a point to, to let what Jesus did on the cross count for you for the first time. To, to, to ask Him to, to come and, and be the Lord of your life, to save you from your sins. Or whether, it's, or, or whether it's a willingness to surrender all the things you're holding on to. You say, I, I want this more than I want an unbroken relationship with God. Whatever it is that causes you to fear the presence of God because of the brokenness of sin, Jesus' death on the cross invites us to lay it down. To lay it down in salvation, to lay it down in a pursuit of holiness that says, no, I want the unbroken relationship with God who comes in thunder and lightning dark clouds of smoke and fire and terrifies me. But is the only place I truly feel home and safe. Fear is a sketchy, sketchy thing. And when we allow sin to direct what we are afraid of, rather than allowing God's holiness to direct what scares us, put ourselves in the place humanity has stood since the garden.
terrified of the one who loves us most. Let's pray together.